Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Ann Thompson, and I'm the Assistant Director for Public Services at the Essex Library. And I am thoroughly delighted this morning to welcome Francis Palmer to our virtual stage. But first, the usual house rules. Please keep your microphones muted and cameras off for the best reception and recording. If you think of questions you'd like to ask of Francis, please go ahead and type them into the chat and we'll get to all of them after her presentation. As you know by now, most of you, we report our attendance to the State Library. So I have launched a poll. If you would please do me a favor and put in the number of people who are viewing your screen with you this morning, I'd be very grateful. And I appreciate your help with uh, making our numbers more accurate. Um, so many thanks for that. And I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll and clear the screen so you can see that beautiful first slide of Francis's. I became aware of Francis Palmer through the barn talks at Hollister House a few years ago, and I was instantly drawn in and taken by the beauty of her pottery, not to mention her dahlias. I've had my breath taken away by the images in her Instagram feed. And if you haven't already seen it, please go ahead over, not right now, but after the talk um, to at Francis Palmer to see what I'm talking about. Her book, Life in the Studio, uh, is just made for the perfect opportunity to invite her to share her wisdom with our community this morning. Um, she is a potter known for her handmade functional ceramics. She lives and works in Weston, Connecticut, so not terribly far away. Her pieces have been featured in T, the New York Times Magazine, Vogue, El Decor, Martha Stewart Living, The World of Interiors, House and Garden, British House and Garden, and Veranda, among many other publications. And I would like to share with you that Dominique Browning wrote the introduction to Life in the Studio, and she described a favorite pot made by Francis this way. The pot conveyed the essence of gardens, the joy of living with flowers, and the pleasure of summer's magic. And with that, I give you the one and only Francis Palmer. <laughs> Thank you. So should I take this, this poll off? There, there we go. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for joining us this morning. And thank you, Anne and the Essex Library for inviting me to speak. Um, my book came out last fall, Life in the Studio. And I was asked to write it about a few years ago to talk about my work process in the, the, the creative process in the hopes of inspiring people to take up their own, to, to believe in their own ability and act on their own wish to do their own work. And uh, unbeknownst to us, when we started this project, we had no idea there would be a, a global pandemic. And I'm hoping that this book has helped people, some of the people who have worked from home or question their work and realize the, how important it is to really take advantage of every day. So, um, so we'll begin. And this is the front piece of the book. And in this photo, it kind of encompasses a lot of the things that I love doing books, doing research, growing the flowers, making the pots, doing the arrangement and taking the photo. And this is really kind of the three pronged side of my process, making the pot, growing the flowers, and taking the photo. Uh, and as Anne just mentioned, Dominic Browning, who's a very dear friend, wrote the introduction. And this is these are bookshelves in her house. And it just, to me, I love this photo, which is in the book, because it shows my pots, but things she's gathered on a walk, feathers, just kind of the all the paraphernalia of the everyday life. And that's really one of my main goals. The first essay in the book is about how I intentionally make things that are useful. They, they are sculptural because I've made them with my hands and they're irregular and they're imperfect, but yet people can work with them and use them every day. And that to me is just such an important goal. Um, and this, I think the quote here is covered up, I believe, by all these photos on the side. But this is, this is an essay that I came across after the book was published by um, the conceptual Japanese artist Li Yufan about how the hand is the friend of the mind, but it's also a tool. And I just love 
that kind of image because I get an idea of what I want to make in my brain and then it has to flow through my hands and into the clay so that the, the hands are my conduit between my intention and the actual making. And this is a photo of um, a dear friend of mine, Phoebe Cole Smith, that's also in the book. And I took it a couple Christmases ago. And this is her bookcase. And she is a chef and a farmer and she works with my pots all the time. But yet when she's not living, when she's not using them, they're sitting on the shelf. So I love the idea that the pots can be used, but when they're not being used, they they are equally important in people's rituals. And I am a self-taught potter. I actually ended up getting an, an undergraduate and graduate degree in art history. And so the books in my life are super important. This is a fraction of the books that I have. I've got books piled everywhere. And they're something I constantly reference when I'm approaching my work. But, uh, as I said, I've always made work with my hands and originally wanted to be a printmaker, but I went to do the art history. And then after we moved to Connecticut on the other side of Weston from where we're living now and had, uh, had a baby, which was a completely new experience that I was unprepared for. Uh, my husband said, why don't you try to do something that you've always wanted to try and never had time. And I had been studying the, um, the art of the, of the Bloomsbury artists in the Omega workshop, and they had a farmhouse. This is the exterior of the farmhouse in 1916. But what inspired me was that these artists, they did the wallpaper, they did all the pottery, they painted paintings and prints, and everything in the house was created by them. And that was something that I thought was completely magical, and I wanted to try it myself. So here's a photo of their kitchen. It's, it's now a museum, you can go visit it and you can see the tables painted and the, the, the chimney screen is painted and all the pots and the walls. And I just thought, this is what I wanna do. And here are some of the pots that I looked at that are currently in the uh, v &A Museum in London. So it's a low fire pottery painted with underglazes and a lot of whimsy. So I signed up for a throwing class at New Canaan, in New Canaan, Connecticut at the um, Silvermine Art Guild. And these were my first pieces. And the, the, the kiln was a gas fired kiln and most of the clay was stoneware with, with oxides. So I really tried to kind of do my vision of painting, but that really didn't work. So I quickly left there and set up my own studio in my house. And these were some of the first pieces I started to paint using the white earthenware as a canvas. And so I painted and painted and painted. And just right away, I started selling the work because as I say in the book, I, I, never, approached, I never approached the ceramics as a hobby. It was always a metier. I was searching for a metier that I could have while I, my children were growing up. And uh, so these early pieces were sold quite, quite right off the bat, which made me super happy. However, after a few years, I felt that um, I had done as much painting as I wished to do and had enough to say. So then I just ended up using the, um, the, the, uh, the white clay at, for its sculptural possibilities. And in the book, I have a number of recipes woven in that I've used over the years. And um, I talk about my mother teaching me how to make pie dough when I was about six or seven and the idea of working with my hands and making something. And this is the crust that I use to this day and a, a leek tart that I'm often making and I include that in the book. So this is a photo. So for, ten, so for a number of years, we lived in a small glass house, 40s glass house. But by the time we had three children and a dog and I was draping pots everywhere, we moved across town to the house where we are now, which is in 1850s. Federal, and for about 10 years, I worked in the basement, um, and which was great because I could be being an old house, I could hear everybody upstairs, and uh, and in the um, and in the in the book, I talk about centering the clay as a metaphor for for just putting my mind into what I'm doing, focusing every day, and 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 the idea of working at something every day. So if I'm home. If I'm in Weston, I am in the studio every day. So it's great when I travel, but 
it's not it's not a chore for me. It's something that I'm constantly drawn to. And um, let's see if I can get this to work. So this is just a quick video of me throwing a vase. So here, so again, when I'm making bud vases, even though I have the same amount of clay, I, everyone is going to be different intentionally. I don't, even after the thousands of vases I've made over the years, I still, I just, I love that process of having a, a, an image in my mind and then sitting down and seeing what happens because it's, it's not predictable. And I just, I've learned to kind of embrace for example, today here where it's so damp and rainy, the throwing is a completely different experience from throwing on a day where the sun is shining and there's no humidity. It just the clay is so in tune with what's going out in the world that it's, it's always an interesting consideration. So this video obviously is speeded up a little bit. And there's a whole discussion in the book about how long does it take to make a pot? And that's really just about impossible to say because um, every piece is different and every, depending on the size, as I said, the weather, and there are just so many variables, it's really hard to predict. Um, okay, hold on, let me find my arrow. Okay, so, so, and the thing that I have to remember is that I have such a clear understanding of all the different steps, but people are, don't, aren't familiar with how much, how much time it takes to make a pot. So here, so I've just showed you throwing it. This is after it's dried to the leather hard stage, everything is trimmed and designed. And then I put it in the kiln for the first firing. And then there's a second firing. So the clay after that, here, I'll go back. This is the clay is kind of gray, the earthenware is gray. And then after it's fired, it's turned white. And then I use a transparent glaze. So you're actually looking at the color of the clay. Uh, here is, uh, I work in a high fire transducent porcelain. And this is what, what blue and white cobalt painting looks like when the clay is raw, when the, before it's been fired in the gas kiln. And this is what it looks afterwards. So the, what happens, the transformation is very clear in my brain, but of course I, I try to explain to people that there's so many stages, just like when you're planting a seed like a sunflower and then it gets to be 14 feet high. And to me, that kind of transformation is what is most intriguing. Um, I have an essay in the book. This is a kintsugi bowl. This is a bowl that was broken and I, repaired it with the Japanese technique of lacquer and gold. And I'm using this bowl in the book as a metaphor because I tell the story about when I was 14 and I had an older brother who was 16 who always had a lot of problems. And when I was a freshman in high school, I went to wake him up for school and he had died of an overdose overnight. And that whole experience, which transformed our family also gave me lessons very early on about, about making every day count, making it important and valuing time and not wasting it and, and, and understanding that to be alive, it takes a lot of work. And it was really impressed upon me quite early on. And it's something I really hold very close to me on a daily basis. Um, and then I was also, after this book was published, read this great quote, quote by Goethe about all truly, Wise thoughts have been thought already thousands of times, but to make them truly ours, we must think of them over again, honestly, till they take root in our personal experience. And, and to me, that I relate that to my work because I spend so much time studying ceramics, especially ancient ceramics. And yet after I, this is the overflow room in the Met that I go to again and again of Cycladic and Etruscan pottery. And I love these forms and yet when I make them, thinking of them, they transform into kind of my sensibility. So this is a large terracotta pot that I made for a, an installation a couple of years ago and a collection of, of pots inspired by Socratic pottery for Aaron Lauder, for um, 
one of her fragrances. But it's not just ancient work that inspires me. I look at a lot of, con well, this isn't contemporary, but not ancient. This is Agnes Martin, and this was a show a few years ago at the Guggenheim Museum and of her abstractions. And yet, um, which I, I went with Dominique Browning, and we were looking at all the different patterns in her paintings. And then Dominique asked me to take a lot of the patterns and transform them into tiles for her kitchen, which I did. And, uh, and I, I love how she hung them in, in her kitchen. Um, but ever since I was a teenager, I've kept journals. I keep journals of, of sketches and uh, recipes and exhibitions I've seen and patterns I've knitted. And I've just got books and books and books. And what intrigues me is when I go back and look at them, things that I did 20, 25, 30 years ago, the same things still intrigue me. And I, it's just a kind of, an ongoing consideration. I work primarily in three different clays, earthenware on the left, porcelain in the middle, and terracotta. Uh, and what I love about the earthenware is it allows me to have a lot of whimsy. It's, it's a very cooperative clay. So the cake plate on the bottom is about two feet wide, and you can have these vast expanses of distance in earthenware that's not achievable in the porcelain because it'll slump. And I love to make tulipiers and all sorts of whimsical shapes. And here is a, a, a group of bud vases that I made last fall for a wedding that they wanted to run them down the table. And every pot, when I sit down, we, cut, we have a conversation and the pot says, well, I think you should do this to me. And I'm like, okay, I'll do that. And so each one always ends up different. And as I said earlier, no matter how many thousands of pots I've made, each one will always be different. Uh, the terracotta I use as vases, as well as in the garden and for serving pieces. And that actually is a very challenging clay to work with because if you're going to be putting things together, the pedestals and the bodies, you have to really watch it like a hawk. It's very particular. But again, I love using them for vases and uh, lots of different things. And then the porcelain, which vitrifies at about 2350 degrees, here, it's, these, these pots are unglazed, but yet functional. And I love that kind of cool blue of the clay versus the kind of creamier earthenware. And then I went in 2013 to, and did a residency in Jinzhen, China um, to learn about, I just felt I needed to understand the origins of porcelain and I did a residency there. And then one of the people who came in and spoke to the artists was a young man and who taught us how to do the blue and white cobalt paint, painting, which I, I still do to this day. And then also with the porcelain, I spend a lot of time making all the glazes. So this is a, a study for all different ash glaze experiments. And then um, a lot of different celadons. I love all the different nuances of the different recipes that I put together. And then also, um, uh, this is a Shinagoi, sorry, I thought I turned the phone off, but anyway, um, that must be the fax machine. So this is a great Shino recipe, which is Japanese, Oribe, which is this beautiful green, uh, and oxblood back to the Chinese. So I spend a lot of time playing with these different recipes, and uh, I just, I love the results. Then in the book, there's a whole section on how I finish pots in different ways. So these are the earthenware pots with, and I, I love to make handles uh, that because they're, they, even when they're whimsical like this, they have to function. And then, um, sorry, hold on here, something. And then the handles of the pitchers. I, I love to make pedestals. So this is a square pedestal on porcelain very much inspired by Brancusi. And um, the beads are also a bit of a signature, which I started to do many years ago to protect the edge of the, of the um, earthenware platters. And then again, as I said, everything kind of segues where each, each piece is done differently. Um, and here's another little video about finishing.
So this is making that milk splash edge that I, I always make. And this is done at the leather hard stage after the, the thrown piece has dried for a few days. So I so every bead on my pots is handmade. I've again, I don't know, millions of beads, who knows? Um, and then I have different other techniques such as putting holes in the pots or making these folded edges. And I make these um, these lines in the pots by putting my fingers in and pulling them up just as the um, the pots are thrown. And then I have done a bit more painting. This was again, a project for Aaron Lauder based on all the different cycladic patterns. And I go into the book talking about the idea of repetition and repetition is something that I love so much because I feel in doing the same thing over and over again, you just gain so much knowledge. And each time I make a shape, I just, I, I keep learning, it's never, where, oh, I've done that, I, I can move on. And, um, and another example of a, a pot that I'm still making today and everyone will always be slightly different. And then in the book, I have uh, this recipe for tarte de tain, which my husband makes fun of me because one summer, I think I made a tarte de tain every day until I found the recipe that I liked. And this the recipe that I did like, I share in the book. And then I also get into the idea that you have to have a laugh every day. You can't take everything so seriously. And many a time I'll call up a friend or, or talk to my husband and just have a really good laugh because it's so essential, especially in this crazy world. Um, so I'm going to move on to the garden now. So this is my studio, which we built about 18 years ago. As I mentioned earlier, I was in the house for about 10 years and then we built this. Um, so this is a view from the back of the property where you can see the house, the back of the house and the studio. So I have a very short walk to work, which is great. And it's a plus and a minus in the sense that it, I don't have a lot of boundaries, whereas people who work regular jobs have the weekends off. I kind of work every day, but that being said, that's just how I, how I am. Um, this is the first floor of the studio and I have three wheels of earthenware, terracotta, and porcelain. And here's my earthenware wheel. And that's the table where I take a lot of my photos for Instagram every day. And then this is the upstairs where I move the work when it's finished and do all the shipping. And this little shed was actually built to hold my gas kiln. So the gas kiln is in there. And then to the left, you'll see, my, oops, sorry. Um, you see the tennis court where I have a lot of raised beds. And in the book, again, um, people often ask me like, well, how do you get everything done during the day? And I have this philosophy, a rose, a row is a row is a row based on Gertrude Stein's a rose is a rose is a rose, meaning that I used to do a lot of knitting and if you, and I would carry it with me everywhere. And if I had a moment, I would sit down and knit a row and then I knit another row. And, and the idea being that gradually, if you do things a little bit at a time, it all moves towards completion. So I have just a lot of different projects being moved forward simultaneously during the day. Um, so when we first moved into this house, we built this 50 foot diameter garden, which is still there today. And uh, this is me kind of standing in the middle of all the dahlias in the summer. And then I have, we have a, this old tennis court that was originally built in the 1930s. And we put up new fences when we moved in about 28 years ago, but none of us ever played tennis. So my husband suggested we turn it into a garden and that's what it's been ever since. Um, I grow hundreds and hundreds of dahlias, but they're not for sale, they're just for me. I grow them because I love them and I use them for photography. But I also have, if you've been following me on Instagram, you can see as soon as the bulbs start, I'm Come going outside every day, looking at what's there and cutting it and putting it in a vase. And it's to me, it's this kind of ritual that I just, I love 
I just love to think about it. I really take the photos just because there's everything is so beautiful and I just want to document it. So we have the daffodils and we have, and then this is a good example of walking around. We've got the bleeding hearts and the tulips and the person and the fritillaria and the muscari and everything is just kind of an exercise for me for, for cutting and photographing. And the gardens are arranged so that there's the succession of blooms. So in the fall, I plant the tulips in rows so that when I put in the dahlia cages, that everybody doesn't, I can keep things going without having to disrupt them. And then this is a photo I think I took last week where the, the viburnum and the tulips and it are happening. And um, so I grow all different shapes of tulips just so I have options for putting them in the vases. And um, then shortly we'll be moving on to the peonies. These are peonies from a couple of years ago. And I grow a lot of old roses that bloom once, but now I've been adding a lot of David Austin roses, which um, will keep blooming across the summer. And species roses. So again, these are on the periphery of the garden bed so that I have, I can keep all the dahlias and everything in the center. And then, um, I love bearded irises and the good news about them is that you don't have to plant them in a fenced in area. Um, and they're just to me so incredibly exquisite. So I keep adding them every year and very much inspired by the paintings of Cedric Morris, who is an Englishman who had his own garden and was a bearded iris breeder of great renown. And um, so he is a great inspiration for me. And uh, so we can't unfortunately get his bearded irises here. They've been revived in England, but I, I try to get as close as I can. And then there are so many volunteers in the garden that um, you, out, over time, the tennis court has cracked and all sorts of plants come up in the cracks. And I, I try to let everybody kind of have their day in the sun and then incorporate them into the different flower arrangements. and. Um, Again, so here are the peonies, the bearded iris, and the roses are starting. And then I have those funny alliums in the back that every time I try to pull them out, they come back anyway. So I've given up. Um, a lot of foxglove self-seed around the property, and those are so incredibly beautiful. And I pull them in as soon as they start to bloom. And here we have, um, there's some buttercups and I have uh, their wild roses and ladies mantle and then the lilies start. So again, this idea of one thing comes into bloom and as it goes out of bloom, something else is coming in and I'm just going to incorporate that. This is a lot of the roses blooming simultaneously with the lilies and clematis and poppies. And um, it's just really so much fun. Here I'm um, moving at, so the white rose in the front is Sally Holmes, which does bloom all season long. And I have the lilies and some salvia and calendula. I grow a lot of Osage I see in there. I grow a lot of herbs and I've been um, planting a lot of gladiolas lately, which are kind of went out of fashion because they were so commercialized, but, um, but they're really beautiful and you could get so many wonderful heirlooms. And now the dahlias are starting and I've got cosmos and salvias and, and I grow a lot of um, cherry tomatoes just so that I can put them in the arrangements. And here are the hydrangea and the lilies and the uh, rudbeckia. And the lilies are kind of taking over the brown garden, but I can't bear to pull them out. We're, we're gonna have to move them around, I think this year. And, uh, but again, cut immediately, put into, this was a group of, um, Celadon that came out of the kiln last summer. And then um, there are the lilies. And the lilies are going out just as the dahlias are coming in. And there's some gladi late gladiola. And uh, a lot of amaranths are in there in the garden. I love to grow marigolds and zinnias. And just again, just having all this plant material for me to kind of think about and work with. And then on to the full full blowing out of the dahlias. Uh, and then the past couple of years, I've been growing chrysanthemums. So I built a greenhouse so that when the frost came, I could move them inside. So this was last, last fall. And then the, I think they're, again, such extraordinary geometry. 
And uh, so I tried to order in terms of color and size just to have lots of material to work with. And the hostas, you know, uh, crab apple, uh, dried hydrangea. So this was about last November. And then there's a whole thing in the book about uh, making plaster casts of flowers and how I use them. And I have these on the tennis court because I think they're so important for pollinating. And I just think they're really miraculous. Uh, some years I am able to get honey, some years I don't, but that's really not my main goal. I just love to have them in the garden. Uh, then in the book, there's a whole discussion about collaborations and I list a lot of the different projects I've worked on over the years. And this is one that I'm currently working on, which is a um, creamware being made for me from my original prototypes by this wonderful company, 1882 Limited in Stoke-on-Trent in the original uh, Wedgwood, Wedgwood factory. And this is a photo that they took. And, uh, and then in the book, I get into photography, talking about flower arranging. And these are some of my inspirations, of course, beautiful old Dutch. And then the uh, people have the idea that flower photography kind of started with Instagram, but no, um, when soon as photography as a medium was developed, the photographers were doing flower arrangements. This is from 1845. And uh, Constance Fry, who of course has an exhibition happening in London, which I'm desperate to get to, and uh, Irving Penn, a huge inspiration. And so in the book, I get into how I go about doing um, flower arranging and it goes through the different steps and the ideas. And then I talk about how I do flower, thinking about the flower arranging. And, um, and then I go into a bit about the photography and how I think about setting up the photos, dark, light, cool, hot, and all sorts of ways to approach it. And uh, there's an essay about listening to yourself because I tell the story about this, this flower arrangement on the left, which I made. And as I ran into the house to put the photo in the computer, I knew that it wasn't stable. And sure enough, when I came back, the, the flowers and the pot had fallen on the floor. So listening to yourself, how important that is and taking time for tea and enjoying the afternoon sun. And uh, then I, the third part of the book talks about moving forward and things that I'm working on. And I had in 2018, I built this wood fired kiln, which I'm still working out. So this was a photo from one of my first firings and, um, and how beautiful they are and how I'm learning to work with the process of the ash and the fire and these, pots have been exhibited with um, Abby Bankser and they were, they were in the noise house in the fall and now they're going to be in a house starting next week in, um, in Austin, New York. So that's been really fun. And uh, now it's time to go back to the garden and dig up the, take out the tubers out of their boxes and put them back in the garden. And, um, and that's it, it all kind of starts all over again. So that, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Francis. That was uh, uh, quite a whirlwind tour through the book. And I will say having uh, gone over the book uh, earlier this morning that there is so much more content in there, but it, that was a wonderful um, uh, view of many of the essays. And, and I will say it is contraindicated for me as a librarian to be encouraging people to go out and buy their own copy of this book. The library does have a copy of Life in the Studio and I encourage you to borrow it, but I, I would strongly encourage you, given all of the content in this book, to have a copy of your own that you could refer to at any time, whether it's because you want to just open something that is eye-wateringly beautiful, or if you want a step-by-step -step how to make a, the most delicious pie crust or roast chicken, or if you want to find out how to light your own photographs. There are so many generous moments in this book that Frances has shared her wisdom um, that it really, uh, I'm sure, could have been priced way more than what it is. Um, so I, as a reader, thank you, Frances. It's, okay. um, something that I'm going to refer to personally for a very long time now and will encourage 
um, very, very sincerely to other people. Um, we have asked people to type their questions into the chat. And if you have uh, waited to do that, please go ahead and do that now. I have a few questions of my own. The first is, how, how long did it take you to write this book? Because it seems like it could have taken years and years. Um, it took a couple of years. Let's see, we started in um, 2017. And the editors at Artisan and Ellen Morrissey, who, who worked with me, were fantastic. So it took about two years. Yeah. And uh, did the editors have any say in the photo? You know, no, not the red one. We want the orange one. I think it was, you know, I have thousands and thousands of photos. We really <laughs> had like way too much material. So we really, it was hard because some of the things that I really loved got edited out. But I think it was more, um, it, was, it was really a group discussion on what photos we felt, you know, supported the text and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. And, and I did read that you, you draw in the morning sort of the concepts of the pots or, or yeah. pottery that you're going to throw that day. Are you, are you a doodler? I mean, are you constantly thinking and then doodling down designs? Yes, and also, you know, now because I, I have done so much work, I've gotten in the habit of if I throw something new, I immediately n make notations about the mem the measurements and things like that because I'm, I have so many kind of balls in the air simultaneously that I find I'm not remembering like I used to. So <laughs> I write it down. And so it's not just doing it in the morning. It's really over the course of the day as I'm you know, making, making new things. Sure. Well, I, I hope you're keeping um, all that in, in some digital format that could be shared widely later on, just uh, so people can learn. I, you've, you've given so much of the details of the process of how you work um, and in many ways, how you live. Um, are you still knitting? Not so much now. If I travel, if I travel, which of course we haven't done in, you know, a year and a half now, <laughs> I usually bring knitting with me to do on the plane just because I'm, I'm very, as you might have gathered, very bad at sitting still and doing nothing. So I like to travel with knitting, but at home, I don't really have time to knit, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so as a gardener, I have a couple of gardening questions too. And also everybody should know in the book, Francis has very generously uh, listed a lot of lists of resources, not just one list of resources, but there are lists of resources for many, many different things. And I'm, I'm curious about if the pandemic put a, a, a dent into how, were you able to still get your clay and everything that you needed, the, uh, everything you needed to continue working or were you held yeah. up by some things fortunately, too? Fortunately, my suppliers were still working and even if they left the clay on the driveway and we brought them, <laughs> no, seriously, that's what they were doing now. Yeah, fortunately I was being, I was able to get supplies for sure. Oh, that's great. Um, and so have you planted your dahlia tubers already? Or has yeah. it been too cold? So I'm, uh, yeah, I'm gonna start doing that this weekend. Oh, yeah, good. Um, so uh, somebody wrote in and wondered about broader collaborations. Are you, do you have more collaborations in, in mind? Well, um, I have a bunch of them at the moment. I just, I kind of edited that in the book. It talks about collaborations I've done in the past. And then I have, I've, I have two exhibitions, three exhibitions going on at the moment now. Actually, I have photos up at Wave Hill in the Bronx and um, pots at Stone Barns in, in um, Terrytown. And then I'm going to have pots in this exhibition that's opening up this weekend in Ossining at Object Thing. And tomorrow I have a whole new group of pots being released for Moda Operandi. So I have a lot of work happening. I just, I don't always publicize it or, you know, I have to wait to talk about it because they don't want it released until. So yes, I'm doing a lot of different things at the moment. Definitely. It feels like there needs to be three or four of you. Do you, do you have a lot of help or <laughs> in, in the studio or are you truly working in isolation? Well, I make all the pots myself, but 
since the pandemic and my husband was is a menswear designer and was commuting to Brooklyn, but now actually he's been helping me sh do all the packing and shipping, which has been amazing. So he's pretty, he's kind of, that's a big help. And I have a bookkeeper who helps me with emails and correspondence and all the kind of paperwork side of it. So that, so I do have help, but nobody helps me with the making of the work. Uh, Francis and I were chatting ahead of the program and because we're of the, we're women of a similar age and uh, I had mentioned that uh, in our generation, her drive to uh, maintain the integrity of her work um, and to market her work and to believe in what she was doing um, and to have that be an equal task in her daytime regime, both with her family um, and friends, uh, uh, to have that take the sort of priority that it did was um, a really wonderful thing to be able to look back and say, yep, yeah, um, that's, you know, that, that was for forging a path, I would say, in our generation. And I, I'm wondering, given the wonderful advice that you provide in the book, if, if you were perhaps um, having to give advice to your daughter today, which I'm sure you never do, um, if you could speak to the young women uh, of today, uh, what would be your first piece of advice as an artist? Hmm. That's, that's actually a really hard question. Um, I think it would be believe in yourself. I think that's really the starting point. You have to believe in your, that you have something to say and that it has value and then that you have to work on it pretty much every day. And, you know, some people are better than others at promoting my, my this really incredibly talented young woman who is, my son lives with. She's such an amazing artist. And, but, you know, it's hardness sometimes to be able to put, shine a light on yourself. But I think the first thing you have to do is believe in your ability and then things will flow from there. I think that's great advice. Um, and, I, and I should also say that um, uh, the discipline that you evoke and the, I'm so grateful for the offering the concept of breaking tasks down into manageable parts and achievable parts uh, when we usually kind of approach something and it just, it all has to get done in one go. Yeah, and, you know, everything stops until that's done and then nothing gets done. Exactly. Um, I think it gets overwhelming. You think, oh my gosh, I'll never finish this. And so nothing happens. But if you don't, if you look at everything like, okay, well, and actually I've given myself a lot more permission now at the end of the day when I didn't finish something, it's like, well, you did your best. That's all you can do and cover up the pots and go in and have a glass of wine and, and you know, don't be so hard on yourself. Perfect, perfect. Um, we have a question from the audience who uh, asks, do you have staff that help you with the gardens? Well, um, this year I do have a wonderful young woman who is a, works on a farm nearby and she has been coming and helping me and that's been amazing. So some years I've done it myself, but I must say I'm really grateful to have an extra set of hands and especially with the planting and the bees. Yeah, uh, so the bees are a whole other thing. Have you had uh, problems with um, hives uh, not regenerating? You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, two years ago, all my hives made it through the winter, but this year I lost them all. So oh. we just started fresh with three new hives um, like 10 days ago, literally. So we just, a couple of days ago, we released the queen into the hive. <clears throat> excuse me so we you know hopefully everybody's doing okay but yeah it's a lot of work but I I've gotten to the point where I realize you do your best and then after that you know things happen and you just start again leave it to fate well thank you for um all of that advice I I cannot um emphasize it strongly enough what a wonderful book this is um and I'm I'm so grateful to have it and I'm grateful to be able to offer it to people in the library, but I'm just primarily grateful that you wrote it in the first place and were so generous with your thoughts and wisdom. Yeah. Um, and I think if we're done with questions, then we will release you to go back to okay. all the 
the wonderful work right. that you're doing. And thank right. you so much for your generous time this morning. I it's really appreciate you asking me and thank you very much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye.